Welcome to this video. Thank you for being here. We are in dire straits of getting my pastoral innocence here repotted. Roots have grown exponentially long, which I'm hoping is going to work in my favor. I have made a short video explaining why I believe that it's going to be okay. Never a guarantee with orchids though, so we're going to go very, very careful right from the get-go until we find what is going on in the pot and see how radical we get with the root cleanup. So thank you so much for being here, for joining me. Another little thing I'd like to get out of the way is that it is August and August in Spain is the month where everything tends to stop because it's too hot and everybody is on vacation, meaning anybody that is from the north of Spain, anywhere from the rest of Europe, a lot of people come to the coast during this time of year, specifically in August. <laughs> and that's all wonderful. We need the business, but it comes with a lot of noise pollution. And once I get into this orchid, I will not be able to stop what I'm doing, stop the commentary and wait for the cars to go by, for the people to stop talking. And there's gonna be a lot of that maybe in the background that I cannot edit out, so I appreciate the fact that you will stick with the video despite possibly getting a lot of interference in the background. I will do my best. Now, as you can see, my orchid roots are stuck to the pot, so while I talk to you, I'm trying to dislodge them from the edge to see if we can't get her out a little bit gentler, which is always an oxymoron in my opinion. There's no such thing as a gentle repot, but what we can do is try to make it gentler. Now the orchid herself, as you can see, is in a broken pot. And the rim is already deteriorated to the point I can't pick out the orchid using the rim. So I'm gonna get you into a different angle and we're gonna see how I can pull this orchid out of the pot and leave the mask behind to a degree. She has been soaking in calcium and magnesium and seaweed for over an hour now. All right. Let's set you up in a different camera angle and uh, hopefully not do too much damage. So, quick little tutorial. <laughs> How do you get an orchid out of the mask if you don't have a rim to work with? Oh, you pull the whole orchid and the pot comes along with it quite smoothly. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. That was the easy part out of the way. Will she come out of the pot as easily if I just jiggle her? and maneuver in the pot. No, of course not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so my pastoral innocence has been in here for two years and we had bud blast over the winter, so I've never seen her blooms, but we got to the point of juicy, juicy buds. That's how far I've gotten with her. Let's see what I can do if I just squeeze the pot or if I, it's hammer time again. And I'm really, really trying to stay away from the root tips. We'll see how long that lasts. But I have a lot of death in the back here. Let me show you. Ah, to be expected. But you see the new root system is probably also gonna get damaged because it's already so extensive. However, it is a branching root system. Not a very vigorously branching root system, but branching nonetheless. So I am hopeful that whatever damage we do here today, seeing as it's still summer, nice and hot, she's growing a new growth, I hope that that will work in our favor so that that root system will continue along the lines of branching and branch any roots that we damage today. Okay, there's a root tip stuck right there. And something else I wanted to do today, if you're interested, Otherwise, timestamps are in the description. Once we get into the root ball and I'm cleaning it up, I will talk to you about my hunting grounds in Kenya when I was a Toto Kidogo, small child in Swahili. So we're gonna find out a few things about where my first orchid collection was and what was happening around the hood where I went to school and certain little things of interest as they come back into the memory bank. I don't want to use the hammer, but if I must, which I probably must, I'm going to hammer at the back here where there's more death because there I will do hopefully less damage to any of a layman bashing up against the lecker. Oh, 
And this is why I prefer to repot at nubbin stage, <laughs> because I don't know where I can grip onto something without touching, breaking, or smashing a root tip. But we gotta stay brave, because at the end of the day, remember, branching root tip. Just keep that in mind, it is a branching root tip. The only thing holding the orchid in now are the microfiber. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Very, very happy with that. Okay, I'm gonna clean my tray here. And let's have a look first, see what we're up against. Let's make my life a little bit easier when it comes to cleaning my lecker. You see all that? <laughs> it's beautiful, it's beautiful, but we have our work cut out for us. I shall do my best to stay in shot. Really, really, I will double check ever so often. Siliano is off to the right and King is underneath me, so <laughs> I'm kind of lodged in by pets, but yeah, there's a reason for that so that I can do what I have to do and talk to you about my hunting grounds. Okay, so born and raised in Kenya. Born in 1966, yeah. I was a summer baby, at least for that hemisphere. Imagine my horror when I arrived in Europe to understand that December, it's the depth of winter. I used to spend my birthdays on the beach windsurfing all the time. And the beach was called Nyali Beach. The area where I had the apartment or, okay, let me think of in terms of as a child. The area where my parents had an apartment that was subsidized by the cement company my dad was working for was also called Nyali. And it was predominantly a white neighborhood. When I went back with my children, to show them where I grew up. It had, of course, changed hands several times and the decay and the damage and, well, there was no more upkeep to the apartment block and my children were rather horrified to think that that is what I grew up in. It was an apartment block of four apartments, which was pretty, pretty cool. Two on the ground floor and two upstairs. And they were all occupied by people that had some form of dealings with the cement company. On the top of that block, was a complete and full roof terrace. So the apartments were quite large and the upstairs was like a communal roof terrace. Everybody could just get up there and use and it was enormous covering the entire span of the apartment block. And from there, before the trees really, really grew, I could see where my dad would come in with the ship to the old port of Mombasa. And I would wait up there to see his ship come to the horizon and then slowly make the turn into the old port of Mombasa. And that's when I would take off down the stairs and across the fields through the little back lanes so that I could be there on time for watching his ship berth and do all that fun stuff. You know, gangway goes down and on board I went. As the years passed, the trees grew and it was more and more difficult to see, but never mind. That was sort of the fun part. I knew when my dad was coming in and I'd be up there watching and having a look-see. And that is where my orchid collection started because across the road from us were single family homes and they all had their beautiful, lush, expansive gardens. And they grew orchids, not like what we do. Orchids were just part of the gardenscape. They were just there. Some people would have fancier orchids because they would get them elsewhere from Africa and incorporate them into their gardenscape. It was awesome. And that's where I got my first division, having expressed admiration for a big, floofy pink bloom, which now I know is a cattleya back in the day. No idea. Didn't even bother to ask. It was only as I grew older with the orchids and stuff do I remember now what I saw in the gardens back then. And all the neighborhood homes there, they all had orchids and trees, and I you know, the word spread bit by bit about me wanting orchids. I was about 12 and then divisions were given to me or anything that was broken off by monkeys. All these little, you know, bits and pieces of orchids were given to me. And then the gardener in my garden would help me put them into the trees because the higher we went, the more dangerous it got. And he then took charge and did that. And the rest of my orchid growing career was let it rain let the high humidity do its thing and eventually 
An orchid would bloom and I was so proud of myself. I thought, I've got this thing nailed down. What I didn't realize is I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> I had just plonked the orchid into the tree and you know, at the end of the day, mother nature did her thing. I never fertilized, never did anything of the sort, but my main pests were monkeys. I don't know. You know, pseudobulbs look like bananas. Now we know that there are some species out there that, you know, are called the banana orchid. <laughs> For specifically those reasons, and anything that looks like a fruit is kind of in danger of being attractive to a monkey. Let me tell you that I was not irritated one bit. Now I sunburn a leaf and I am so angry with myself for an extended period of time. Yeah, things change. But anyway, so sunburned leaves, they were ratty looking things. The way orchids grow when you just leave them alone. But they were my things, they were my pretties. And I used to be in the trees quite a lot, climbing up and checking them out. It was so fascinating to watch the roots grow. So, in that little hood, if we cross the road, of course, then we get to those homes where I hung out a lot. A lot of my school friends lived there as well. And on the other side, there was a typical African village where I used to hang out a lot with my friends. And to get there, I used to climb over the big white wall that was surrounding the apartment block I lived in. So we would be sitting on that wall and then jumping over it to get to the village. And then we would roam the little streets of that village. And let me tell you something, when I say friends, I'm talking friends that lived also in that village, but they were Kenyan, they were not white. So please don't think at any point in time when I speak of something here, my friends are my friends. I'm not trying to offend anybody by always repeating, it was a Kenyan friend, it was a European friend, it was a British friend. I had friends everywhere. I even had Indian friends. So if we, you know, if we want to go down that road, I'm gonna have to put a whole list together of all the different cultures that I had friends of. So my friends, we hung out wherever and it didn't matter who it was. They were my friends. I didn't even know to, to distinguish between everything until I got to Europe and somebody who was of dark skin color did not respond to me when I said jumbo. I was shocked. That was my biggest culture shock coming to Europe that if I did see somebody that was from Africa, they didn't know what I was saying because they came maybe from Ghana. I, in my mind, always thought, oh, you know, Africa, everybody would speak Swahili with me. Mm -mm, that wasn't the case. So, yeah, talk about naive 19-year-old. And root tips are getting broken as I speak. However, we've got a branching root system, so I'm going to keep going. But meanwhile, that little village back there was amazing. It had everything that you can imagine. It is typical like a shanty town, what we would call now a shanty town. They had a main street, a back street, but we went to the Dukas, and that is like the little kiosk, what we have now here in Europe, you know, the tuck shops and stuff like that. We always went to the Dukas to get our mandazis, which is a bread snack, and we always got free chai. Things were so either cheap or free. My mom would always send me over to the village, to get her cigarettes from the Dukas, so I was always happy to go. And the only thing was come back with the cigarettes and you know, pretty much I was left to my own vices. I could do my own thing and I was not very, very supervised at all. Not to my knowledge anyway. It could be that the word was out that the kids are out and about, you know, keep an eye on them, blah -de blah But to be honest with you, I doubt very, very much that that was any form of reality. It was come home from school, ditch the uniform, and off we went. Oh, your homework, you ask? Oh, I was very bad at doing my homework at home. I used to do my homework at school during lessons until one teacher sort of picked up on the fact that we were doing that and then only gave us our homework assignment after the class had finished, which was most annoying. So I didn't have much homework, and it was only that one teacher, to my understanding, that would actually then just give us our assignment afterwards. Other teachers were really, really nice. They understood what kids were all about. They're in school, they've done their thing, go home and play healthy, be healthy. You're not supposed to be already a workhorse at such a young age. And they would then also say at the beginning of class, 
this is your homework assignment and it is due to be handed in at XYZ date. And normally they were fair enough to actually do the homework based on what was being talked about on the day, which was amazing because, you know, you get to do your homework during in class. Those were my favorite teachers, the ones that thought a little bit ahead. <laughs> But anyway, that is why I had so much free time. I always say, born to be wild, but society won't let me. And until I arrived in Europe, I was wild. Not wild in the sense that I was like Mowgli growing up with the wolves. No, I was wild in the sense that I don't need shoes. I don't need many clothes. <laughs> Usually a sarong would have sufficed. Maybe a t-shirt, and depending if I was running to my dad, it would be flip-flops, but once I was on terra firma that I didn't have to worry about brambles and thorns and everything, the shoes came off. So even on deck of the ship, often, if the heat permitted it, I was walking barefoot. Imagine doing that now, going to any place, and you're walking around barefoot. If I walked into my supermarket here in Spain, with bare feet, I am sure that would raise a few eyebrows and it would, well, I wouldn't even do that today. I've become sort of like, I need at least flip-flops on my feet. But back in the day, the soles of my feet were that of an elephant. <laughs> I could walk across hot gravel, no problem. People were doing the charcoal, hot charcoal walk and I was like, what's the big deal? <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that was the village and that was amazing and I don't know if the audience watching this video is familiar with the caramel bar, it's a toffee candy bar, but not thick. It's called Goody Goody. They were in orange wrappers. They were very, very flat. And it was not a hard caramel. It was a soft caramel. At least it was soft, maybe because of the heat of Kenya made everything soft. <laughs> but it was a flat caramel bar, small little packages, like only that big. But that was one of my favorite things to get a goody goody or two or three or whatever many shillingies I had over after buying my mom cigarettes to, you know, spend on goody goodies. But so many times we were given a goody goody just to have fun with. And I remember the wrapper, it was plastic and waxy so that the caramel wouldn't stick when we peeled back the wrapper and well the heat of Kenya would make that <laughs> kind of obsolete and more often than not we ended up licking our goody goody out of the wrapping <laughs> by nature it wasn't a hard candy it was soft caramel but it wasn't supposed to be melted caramel <laughs> okay so there we go that's my little village now my road was called exhibition road because a little bit further down when you turned right of that lane there, you got onto the exhibition field, which hosted exhibitions once a year. Farm animals, anything that you can imagine from like a horticultural exhibition of sorts, you name it, you know, one of those typical fair kinds of things. But they would always have marching bands as well and I could see the marching bands practice leading up to the event itself up on the top of my rooftop terrace. And even back in the day, I knew that they were very, very out of tune. <laughs> they are all dressed up in uniform, marching around, practicing, and uh, even on the official day, yeah, we needed a little bit more practice as far as I was concerned. Not that I ever was a Maria Callas, no, but I was in many, many choirs. When I say we're going over my hunting grounds, I mean that sincerely, my hunting grounds. I was so rarely accompanied by an adult. It was actually kind of insane. Looking back, that is. Nobody tried to kidnap me. I don't know if that was a hint or not. <laughs> now we don't want that one. She is just too wild. It was wonderful, let me tell you. The only time I had supervision was when I needed to be taken somewhere because I wasn't driving yet. We had a 72 model Volkswagen Beetle. It was gray. It was automatic, even though it needed to have a stick shift, but it didn't have a clutch. <laughs> that was an automatic. You could change gears without pushing down on a clutch. Awesome, huh? Yeah, we bought that one in Germany back in the day. I remember when my dad bought it and then he brought it to Kenya on his ship. The privileges of a captain, I tell you. Trust me, 
my dad made sure he took advantage of that situation. So that beetle being so easy to maneuver, navigate, and learn how to drive, as long as you can drive in a straight line and use your indicators, that beetle became my first ever car. Not that I was gifted it, but it's the first one I ever drove. And then literally it became my car. And I think I was 15 or 16. Meanwhile, I was already riding motorcycles on the properties of my friends, the little ones, the 125 cc. I didn't, you know, give me a straight line, tell me to turn left, and that's it. Changing gears for me on a motorcycle was harder than changing, the coordination was harder than changing gears in the Beetle, so that was pretty easy. The only problem, of course, was I was way too young to have a driver's license, but we're in Kenya. <laughs> Fill in the blanks. <laughs> but yeah, in the previous years before I actually, you know, took the car keys and started the car all on my own. I was supervised by a parent to take me to the beach, which was my beach. Hunting ground number two, Nyali Beach, a beach hotel that had a 25 meter long swimming pool. It was one of the longest pools out there and I was in training and I was a swimmer. I was hoping to go to the Olympics in 88. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here in Spain that didn't manifest itself or else. I would have gone elsewhere, but that's a different story. But I was in training a lot and I used to train using the tide. So if it was high tide in the mornings, I would be out there swimming before I would go to school. If it was high tide late afternoon, I would be swimming before I went home. Now, I didn't necessarily have to go to that beach to train or swim because my school, the second one, I'll get to the first one later, I hope. The second school I went to was very, very close to the beach. And based on the tide, I would actually then just leave the school building and go down to the beach with my trainer and be there swimming to take advantage of the tide. And it was amazing because we're going to get back to the pool because I used to be told to swim against the current with the stroke that I was specializing in, which was butterfly and crawl. And I had to do all these laps with the stroke that I was training on against the current and against the waves. And then I had my rest swim, rest swim, coming back in with the current, which would allow me to rest a little bit before turning around and doing the whole thing again. So that was my training facility was the Indian Ocean. And it was fabulous. I have never swallowed so much salt water in my life since. I can open my eyes underwater in salt water. It doesn't affect me at all. Chlorine doesn't bother my eyes at all. It bothers other people though, because if they looked at me, I had crocodile eyes, bright red from the chlorine. Meanwhile, I also had green hair <laughs> from the chlorine. <laughs> I was pretty, I swear. I was very beautiful as a child. That's probably why nobody even thought of kidnapping me when I was roaming the streets of some dubious neighborhoods. <laughs> Seeing this mzungu, which is the name of what the Africans gave us white people. We were mzungus child with green hair, dark, dark, dark tan, and bright red eyes from chlorine or salt water, either way. But anyway, if I was at my training grounds, then I would go home, and it all depended on the tide. But let me tell you something. When we went into the pool to do the time testing, it was always at this hotel, and, uh, and when I say we, me and my trainer, I wasn't actually training in a team yet. I was sort of like a lone swimmer and, you know, trying to swim in as many heats as I could, go to as many competitions as I could, and of course train for the school's own annual swimming competitions. But when I did get into the pool, after being out there in the water of the Indian Ocean against waves, no matter how high they were that day, that's what was you know, available. And I got into that pool and everything was calm and I had nothing to interfere with my stroke. Whoa, I was flying. I was flying. It was incredible. It was like putting a hot knife through butter and I just plowed through the water. I would say sailed, but of course not. It was to the point that my trainer told me I am exerting too much energy as I come above the water with the butterfly stroke because I had no resistance. I was so used to coming high if the waves were high so that I could finish and complete my stroke. 
in the pool I didn't have that and yet I was still doing it so he said when you're in the pool you only need to come out as far as you need to breathe because there are no waves I was like oh yeah that makes sense and then my times increased exponentially it was insane it was so much fun all the grinding in the waters of the Indian Ocean all the salt water sometimes we had some seriously high waves and then you know you're doing a stroke and you're coming out of the water and botch you get hit with a wave <laughs> well guess who swallowed more salt water and none of that was happening in the pool yeah that was so much fun that grinding that nonsense in the Indian Ocean was the best training I ever ever had I promise you that and it wasn't even painful because I just couldn't wait then to get into the pool and see how fast I was swimming in actual fact because of course going against current going against waves in the ocean made you kind of feel like you're not really getting anywhere fast <laughs> but you know that was a major major breakthrough and experience for me and it made so much sense here's my trainer in his little dinghy next to me swimming 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 giving me markers giving me counts that I should find a rhythm instead of waiting and straddling waiting for a wave just to pretend there's nothing there he was always by my side it was awesome and I tell you then into the pool and I came out the other side with a huge grin on my face <laughs> oh fantastic so anyway my swimming career clearly didn't take off for other reasons some grudges that I still harbor to this day so that was my hunting ground for swimming and I can imagine that at this day and age you wouldn't be able to just use the facility of a swimming pool at your leisure because then one day we actually had to start paying and you know that was so weird we're paying 10 shillings to be able to use the pool why if you want tea if you're not a hotel guest and you want tea and sandwiches and stuff of course you had to pay as a hotel guest it was for free but why are we paying to use the pool yeah so you know even at back in the day that era started to kick in but anyway it was my beach too I used to hang out on that beach day and night and I'm talking night when I say night I mean night I told you I was not supervised until somebody decided to pick me up <laughs> or I ended up sleeping at somebody else's house when my dad was in port he was on time he was clockwork. I wasn't even ready to come home. Imagine the difference. When my dad was out, I was free as a bird. When my dad was in port, he would be there and he would say, you are to be at the lobby of the hotel, X, Y, Z time. I'm coming to pick you up. Don't make me wait for you. Yeah, my dad was in port usually around three days if the cement was being discharged fast enough at the other port because the cement ships were always on a loop on a rotation so nobody was at anchor at any given point in time three days was the maximum turnaround to fill his ship up and then off he went but even with the discos going to the disco at Nyali Beach it was my nighttime hangout I told you I was there day and night and he would be there at midnight sharp and boy if I wasn't at the lobby to be picked up who wants to leave a disco at midnight? Are you kidding me? Things are getting started. <laughs> and if I wasn't there, he would walk straight into the discotheque and embarrass me completely, waiting until maybe I finished a slow dance with someone. Usually it was a Marine. The US Marine used Mombasa as their pleasure port, their free time after being out at sea doing their maneuvers, exercises, and whatever, they would come to Mombasa as a ple pleasure port. So imagine me, I'm there, I know, this is bad. This day and age, it's bad. I'm probably about 14 years old, in the arms of a sailor, having a slow dance, and my dad walks into the disco and stands at the entrance, staring me down like, get home. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, but you know what? Now I know that he meant well and it was all because he loved me. But back then I was like, Dad, he said, it's midnight. And I'm like, Dad, you can't do that. You know, he says, well, I wouldn't be here if you had been in the lobby at midnight. You know, he was very, very insistent about that. Now I understand completely. Thanks, Dad. Know that you are appreciated. And Nyali, being such a predominant name in my childhood, was also the place where I learned to play golf. 
and that was at Nyali Golf Club. Everything is Nyali. Their logo is a little gray monkey that used to be so, so popular up in the trees, all around the golf course, anywhere you looked, everywhere you looked. And that was the logo, or still is the logo, of Nyali Golf Club, which is awesome. It was a perfect match. It made total sense, but I can tell you one thing. There was a par five and you had a blind drive. You would hit your tee shot and you couldn't see where the ball landed because it would go down into like a little valley before then you continued on the flat ground towards the green. And the caddies would always be right at the ridge to watch where your ball was going, but also down in the valley. So they would always split up to make sure that no monkeys walked off with your ball because that was a favorite pastime of the monkeys on the golf course. Waiting for the golf balls to land down there on the fairway or in the rough and they would just run onto the fairway or into the rough and they would pinch the golf ball and yeah, that's you, lost a ball and penalties. <laughs> Go back and tee off again. To my understanding, back in the day, there was no local rule that said on hole 13, you do not have to incur a penalty shot if a monkey steals your ball. I don't think that was in place at the time. And I had one little thing, if you're a golfer and you know what I'm talking about, I never understood why my coach told me, keep your head down. What does that even mean? I'm looking down, I'm not looking at you, I'm looking down. And then if I would top the ball, he would say, keep your head down. <laughs> Some things just didn't make sense to me when it came to certain terminology. But eventually I recognized that I was rising on my downswing and that is why I was topping the ball. And I played golf very, very diligently. I was religious about practicing. I was always thinking that if I don't practice, I don't deserve to be on the golf course during the weekend because I don't want to be holding anybody up, etc., etc. So I wasn't out there just for the <clears throat> and giggles. I was out there, and if it was just for one tee, not even for money. As my years progressed, I was playing golf, not necessarily for money, but if we were betting for a single tee, I'm, trust me, I was going to win that tee. I hung up my golf clubs in 2014 when I moved to the States for work, but, and I haven't touched any clubs since then. My body now is probably going to go, you are crazy. <laughs> Just like when I stopped horse riding because of my back, because Nyali Beach was also where I did a lot of horseback riding, but I never learned how to ride with a saddle until I got to Spain and my son and I took riding lessons and I learned how to ride with all the kit and caboodle in the way. And I was, I had no feel for the horse. I literally had to take riding lessons. <laughs> I was like, I know how to ride. Take the horse into the ocean, climb on its back, hold on to the mane and then squeeze and go. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That was my extent of riding experience. And now I've got all this stuff in the way. You, what? Of course I can ride a horse. Turns out I didn't have the first inkling of how to ride a horse with all the kit and caboodle until I got to Spain. Yeah, but I had to stop doing that because of a very, very bad back. All the fun things I used to do as a child, the only thing that I still have left from those days are my orchids. I'm back to growing orchids. Meanwhile, if you're new to my channel, this is my third collection. My first collection was bare root up in trees, leave them alone, and then get annoyed if a monkey dropped a pseudobulb, try stick that back up into the tree, see what happens. That's it. <laughs> my second collection was clay, bark, chips, and anything organic I could find that could make it work here in Spain, where none of this stuff that we see online today with orchiata bark and everything like that was available. So inorganic, growing what I'm doing now, this is my third collection. Anyway, back to my hunting grounds. We were talking about schools. Yeah, in all of those fun and games, I did go to school. And I started off on the island of Mombasa, in Mombasa itself, which meant, oh, a long commute every morning. And my mom or my dad would take us to school. There would be like school runs. Parents would team up and one week that parent the other week that parent because it was such a tedious undertaking to get to the school that was bang smack in the middle of the island from where we lived it was just nicer that the parents shared the duties and then kids were loaded up into the car five or six at a time <laughs> and taken to school over what was at the time 
Nyali Bridge. There's that word again. Nyali. Nyali Bridge was the longest floating bridge of the world when it existed. And unfortunately, they dismantled it. Even while I was still there, I cannot believe it. It was the only lifeline from the mainland, the side where Nyali and the whole coastline is, to Mombasa town. And if there's anything at all, everything was happening in Mombasa town and we had to go and cross Nyali Bridge. And talk about traffic jams. You got five and six kids in the back seat of a car in a traffic jam. Happy days. I learned to be a very quiet child very, very quickly. <clears throat> and that is probably where my heat tolerance comes from as well. I have no difficulty whatsoever being in blistering heat. And we're talking humidity levels of 80% and higher, depending on the time of year. Fully clothed. Didn't bother me one bit. And to this day, it doesn't bother me. If the mercury rises above 30 degrees Celsius, it seems like I come alive. So that is probably part and parcel of what happened and how it happened sitting in a hot car. Not just Nyali Bridge, but the whole Mombasa town, certain hours of the day were totally congested. So while we were at school, at the Mombasa school is what it was called, we wouldn't go home for lunch. The parent allocated to be, you know, on total watch would take a, would take a place called the Chini Club. Chini in Swahili means down, low, under, not underneath, but below. And the Chini Club actually was called the Mombasa Club, but it was more like a members kind of club where people would have lunch. You know, the typical colonial kind of English establishment where at night in the dining room, you were not going to be served if you didn't wear a tie. Who cares? Time of day. You wore a tie in the dining room as a man or as an adolescent even. If you didn't have a tie, you didn't bring a tie, they would give you one at reception. So that kind of establishment, and I always just knew it as the Chini Club because it was so low against the shore of what was the Mombasa Island. Next to it was a very old Arabian fort called Fort Jesus or Jesus back in the day from the discoverers. Probably Portuguese. Vasco da Gama was a frequent visitor to the Kenyan and African East Coast. So Portuguese. And if I'm wrong, never mind. We will honor the Portuguese for being such good traders in East Africa where I grew up. Anyway, Chini Club was next to Fort Jesus, very, very low up against the water. So if there was high tide and it got wavy, we would get salt water into the Chini Club pool. The whole reason for us not crossing Nyali Bridge to get to home for lunch, but to hang out at the pool of the Chini Club, which was just down the road from my school, making life so much easier where we would have delicious sandwiches, my favorite being cucumber and shredded lettuce. But not the sandwiches that we know now, but you know, little triangle, English style tea sandwiches. Oh, I love them so much. I also liked my egg sandwiches with the shredded lettuce. Put shredded lettuce on something and I would be all over it. I would even eat what was left on the plate if it was just shredded lettuce. I, would, I love that stuff. <laughs> Anybody who picked out their shredded lettuce, I was like, can I have that? Loved my shredded lettuce. There's something so refreshing and crunchy about it. And then if it got a little bit soggy because of ketchup, I would eat it anyway. Listen, I was never picky about my food. Never. The only thing I had to really get accustomed to back in the day was how spicy could I eat a curry? Because I wanted to impress my dad, remember? I'm always about wanting to be with my dad, impress my dad, and <clears throat> he loved his curries. He says a curry is not a curry unless your nose is running and your eyes are tearing up. I needed to get to that point, so I tell you, I was not a picky eater. You put it in my face and I was like, I'll have that and, and, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> if it looked funny, if it looked off, if it was soggy. I loved soggy crisps. I loved soggy chips like French fries. If they were like bending, <laughs> I'll, I'll have it, you know. Everybody else, yuck, soggy crisps. I'm like, nope, give me the bag. I'll take care of it to this day. Soggy cookies. And not because I put the cookies and dunk them in my tea. No, give me a soggy cookie that's been lying on a kitchen counter and it's not crunchy anymore. I'll have it. <laughs> 
to this day. But we used to hang out there at the Chini Club, and I also remember back there Hochtief, a company that was like excavation, diving, archaeological, all of that. They were also right in front of Fort Jesus excavating some old trade ship wreck that was found in the waters there. It was good fun. Not that we ever got to see what they dug up. I never was involved with that. But I remember seeing that team there so long for so many years. And they were excavating and documenting archaeologically, etc., all the things and things that they found from that wreck from bygone, maybe Vasco da Gama days. I won't, I don't remember that detail, but Hochtief was there. And it stuck in my head because Hochtief, high low, translated from German. Hello, German. <laughs> and then. What happened was eventually one of the teachers from the old school, the Mombasa school, opened his own school in Niali, but called it Mombasa Academy. How confusing is that? If you're going to go to Niali, everything is Niali. Why are you calling your school the Mombasa Academy? So we have Mombasa School in the town of Mombasa. That makes sense. But we have Mombasa Academy on the side of Niali. Nah. Anyway, Mr. Bentley was his name. Oh, and Mr. Bentley used to give me a lot of tackies. That's what they were called. It was corporal punishment with the English school system. Either you got hit by a ruler, your hair was pulled. One of my fellow classmates, his head was taken down by our science teacher. Mr. Quiggins, if you're still alive, listen, I remember taking his head down and bashed it up against his desk because he was disrupting the class. Uh, yeah, it was pretty heavy. And Mr. Bentley was the tacky man. He would be with the sneakers, and we called them tackies back in the day, a tennis shoe, and do the punishment for whatever naughty thing somebody would have done using that or the cane. Horrible. Rulers against knuckles during class. Wow, I can't tell you. I remember getting the tacky once, and I tell you, if it was my fault, I would admit it, because now all bets are off. I can tell you how many rules I broke, and I broke a lot, but not at that age, because I was too scared of my mom. I mean, if anybody was, I was afraid of, it wasn't the teachers or whatever, it was my mom. So I was a good girl. I behaved myself, or if I didn't behave myself, I made sure that I was smart enough not to get caught because, again, the wrath of mom, no way. I needed to be out of that house and if there's anything I could avoid getting caught and not being able to be free, I behaved myself and made sure that none of my freedoms were removed from me. So I remember getting the tacky once and it was not my fault. But another guy that I used to be friends with, and you know, at that age, honestly, friends, he was doing something, I laughed my head off, and I copied him. And I don't even remember, that's how insignificant it was. I don't even remember what he did for me to copy him. I thought it was funny. And then off to Mr. Bentley we went and got the tacky. Horrible man. He was a horrible man. Anyway, so he opens his academy down there in Niali, which then, of course, was so much more convenient to put the children into that school. And that's where I stayed f until I went to eighth grade to my American high school boarding school up in the Great Rift Valley. And I was uh, 13 when I went to my boarding school in eighth grade in the Great Rift Valley because my mom had seen the choir on their tour of the Rift Valley Academy. We went to one of their choir concerts that they came while they were on tour. My mom loved the thought and thought that it would be perfect for her daughters to be at that school because all she could see was the choir. And I remember that concert was the year that would have been seventh grade for me because promptly I was enrolled in September of 1980 and I was in eighth grade. And then guess what? The rebel in me refused to try out for the choir at the Rift Valley Academy, refused. So if you don't try out, of course, <clears throat> how do you get into the choir, right? My mom was furious, absolutely furious. So then, of course, for my ninth grade year, and it was hard to get into choir. The school was much bigger than I was accustomed to, and it was juniors and seniors that had priority because they were going to be graduating soon. So the longer you were at the school, and the higher up you were in your grades or close to graduation, if even if you were a mediocre singer, you normally got picked above somebody who was in eighth or ninth grade, even if they had a better voice. That's just how it was. So I told my mom I didn't make the cut. I lied. 
The reason I didn't try out for the choir is because my mom was so desperate for my sister and myself to be in the choir, which I thought was so pathetic and thirsty. Just being very honest here. And I don't like that. I don't like thirsty. <laughs> Anyway, I said to her that in eighth grade, I cannot get into choir if I don't have an angel's voice. And the reality is I had a great voice, but not the voice of an angel that would warrant me in eighth grade taking the spot of somebody who was about to graduate. End of. Anyway, she found out that that wasn't even true, that I hadn't even tried out. So, ouch. But yeah, so in ninth grade, I did try out for the choir just to avoid the inevitable and um, didn't put my heart into it at all because I didn't want to get picked. You know, there's always that danger. So I didn't make the cut until my senior year because, you know, again, now I'm a senior. I'm about to graduate. I've got a good voice. I do. I have had. Maybe still do. I don't know. That's just not for me to judge. But yeah, so in my senior year, I made the choir. But by that time, my relationship with my mom had deteriorated considerably. So I don't even think she came to any of the concerts that we attended down in Mombasa. And we had like five or six at different venues, at churches, and especially the Christmas tour, always the reenactment of the Christmas story. So yeah, she wasn't, I don't think she attended any of those. Had I known that before, trust me, I would have tried out sooner because it was so much fun to be out and about with a group of people getting dressed up in costumes, sitting in the wings, waiting for your part, or hundred voices singing fabulous songs, including Hallelujah by Handel, that Hallelujah, not the other one. <laughs> so yeah, those are some of the stories of my hunting grounds. Not to mention my first ever home that I do remember being the best one ever because it was right by the beach. Right by the beach in Bamburi not Niali, Bamburi. It was amazing. And that house still exists. And I think my sister has the concrete slab with our footprints when we were little. I think she has that. I don't know how she got it. But anyway, I think that is in our possession. But that was a home where, oops, there is a mamba in the yard. And our yard was white sand. And there was just a flagstown path leading down to the beach. I had my Aya, and that is my nanny. She was always around. She was also the housekeeper, so to speak. And her husband was the gardener. And then one time I had a python curled up in my wicker basket that was full of toys. It had gone into hibernation. The wicker basket was right by the air conditioning and the cold air caused the python to curl up and go to sleep until one day somebody heard snoring and we couldn't figure out where it was coming from until the shamba boy which is the gardener came and had the wherewithal to say snake there's a snake in there and we we're like "Ooh, snake like big deal <laughs> the thing is that we didn't know what kind of a snake so it was a big deal and it is in that toy basket like <laughs> Yeah, probably not a good idea. But I can tell you that he pulled that toy basket out with a lot of respect, with a very long hook stick, didn't touch it, out of the room. And um, I didn't see the snake afterwards until probably dinner time when they were eating it. <laughs> True story. Tastes like chicken. Back in the day, I thought, no, I'll pass. Snake was not on the menu in my diet until I got to the States when I went there for a trip and I had rattlesnake and I was delighted. I thought it was absolutely delicious. So that was down at the beach of Bamburi and my goodness, it was amazing. Amazing. That house, loved it. And one of my friends that lived down there, I think I told you about the Hullas in one story where the Bamburi cement company, the quarry has been turned into a green zone. That was Mr. Halla and they were our neighbors. And if I remember correctly, and if he is still there, it is one of the younger brothers that lives in the home where I grew up now. He sent me pictures once. That was back in the day when I was on Facebook. He sent me pictures once and showed me how they've changed the home and I can still recognize the old part, but boy oh boy, did they do a lot of work on it. It's even more paradise now than it was back then. And they have a pool, way to go. There was a pool, whereas back in my day, the pool was the Indian Ocean. And I'm like, why would you want a pool? <laughs> 
Yeah, but that was beautiful. It was nice to see. It was very nice to see that one of my neighbors from back in the day now lives in that house. Awesome. So if more stories about my hunting grounds come to mind at some other point in time, if you're interested, I will let you know. But in a nutshell, that gives you an overview of the ongoings and shenanigans of when I was small living in Mombasa. And in the meantime, we have gotten quite a bit out of this root system. I still have some dead roots stuck in between other roots, and I'm not sure if I really am that ambitious to get all the way through and get them all out because I really don't want to damage what I consider a fabulous job so far while talking. <laughs> this one can multitask, who knew? Now considering how shriveled my pseudobulbs are, I'm surprised that that's the case because this root system is amazing. Despite the fact we cut away quite a bit of the dead, there's nothing wrong with the root system. So why the pseudobulbs are that shriveled, Sijui, and that is Swahili for I don't know. But we're gonna get her potted up and uh, before it gets dark. <laughs> Filling the pot up just with plain RO water. Let's just correct that. Filling up the reservoir with plain RO water. Everything this orchid needed, she has had leading up to this. And flushing will resume with intensity to get all that debris out. But hey, we made it. And I hope that you enjoyed the little bit of insight into my hunting grounds and get a better understanding of where all this craziness came from. <laughs> if you have any questions, you know the drill. Leave them in the comments, please. I have no idea how long this video is, but if it is already very long and you stayed all the way to the end, thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I wish you a fabulous day, as always though, on one condition, that you please, please, Stay safe. Take care. Bye.